Ambassador Lu, a year has gone since, uh, almost a year, since October 7th, uh, and the war is still fought in many fronts, in the north and south, uh, from the east, from the deeper south, uh, you name it. In the past, whenever wars erupted in the Middle East, uh, the United States worked very hard and very quickly to, to call a ceasefire, to arrange uh, the international community to push and supervise uh, that ceasefire. That has not happened. Why? And what can change it? Well, good to be with you, Aluf. Um, I think uh, if you look at what the United States has been engaged in diplomatically uh, for the past months, uh, it has been exactly that, uh, trying to bring together the world at the United Nations, calling for a hostage release and a ceasefire together, uh, bringing the parties together uh, in, uh, in, 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 in Doha, in, in Cairo, in European capitals uh, to try and frame an agreement. At each step of the way, the United States has driven the process, driven the process to keep people engaged and talking, to force ideas into the conversation, to bridge differences, uh, and to not give up. And that is where we are today. Uh, we are pressing as hard as we can from the president down through the entire team uh, to reach uh, an agreement on a ceasefire and a hostage release. The fact that it hasn't occurred is not uh, the same as the United States not being engaged in the effort. What's different here is that uh, with Hamas and the attack on October 7th, we were dealing with a different kind of, of threat, a different kind of enemy. Um, it's not a government. It's not in direct contact with uh, uh, either Israel or the United States. It's negotiating through intermediaries. Um, it's a very complicated uh, process. And ultimately, one person on the Hamas side gets to decide and getting him to the place of making a decision, as was the case in November for a ceasefire, is going to be uh, what it takes again. So we're going to keep pushing uh, for uh, all of uh, the parties to stay engaged and to have a successful uh, completion to the negotiation. And you feel that the Israeli government and the Prime Minister in particular are engaged, they, they want to reach uh, that kind of deal, or, or as is often argued in Israel, uh, they don't want a deal? I think there has been uh, a, a very long process of negotiation where uh, it has been difficult to close issues. I think it's uh, it's a difficult set of concessions that have to be made in order for there to be an agreement. Um, and I think at the moment where things stand is uh, we don't know uh, what Hamas is willing to accept. And uh, we're pressing for Israel, the United States, Qatar and Egypt to bring together as close as we can one position in the end to force a decision by Hamas. I think at various moments uh, there were different degrees of military pressure and different degrees of diplomatic flexibility that uh, could have moved things forward. The military pressure remains high. The last indications we've had from the government of Israel are that there's flexibility on the key issues and we need to drive it to closure. Uh, Vice President Harris in the presidential election debate mentioned the ceasefire and hostage release as part of a wider process that would ultimately uh, pave the way towards a future two-state solution or a Palestinian state. Is that in the cards? Is that really a viable option today? Although if the U.S. strategy is clear, we think there needs to be a ceasefire and a hostage deal in Gaza immediately to free hostages, save lives, and enable the, the, the delivery of humanitarian assistance uh, to proceed at a faster pace. But there's also a strategic moment. If there's a period of quiet in Gaza, we think it opens a pathway to having a negotiated uh, agreement in the North to avoid a full-scale war. I mean, we've seen daily tit-for-tats between Israel and Hezbollah. Uh, this morning, 
uh, no exception. And um, I think the, 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 the challenge is doing it quickly enough so that it doesn't roll into a, a scale of conflict that I don't believe either the government of Israel or Hezbollah want. You move east to uh, Saudi Arabia. I think Saudi Arabia is committed uh, to having a normalization uh, negotiation completed successfully. I think they very much want the agreements between the United States and Saudi Arabia that they're seeking. I think they understand the significance strategically of having an agreement with Israel. Mid-April, we saw what the difference is when the region is united in defense. And I think the challenge is getting that conversation across the finish line. What we've been saying for months is that the two things that are necessary to get that Saudi-Israeli normalization conversation completed are a period of quiet in Gaza and a willingness to engage in a conversation about Palestinian self-governance that does not permit the possibility of a militarized Palestinian state that gives Israel every ability to defend itself but that embraces the notion that ultimately the idea of a Palestinian state is one that the parties uh, are, are looking uh, to achieve. Um, that's a big step. I know in the current uh, political environment, the public opinion in Israel uh, is not very positive on that. But I also don't think that it's been cast in a way to give the public the ability to make a clear-headed decision. In our view, it is an enormous defeat for Iran and Hamas if the outcome of this conflict is normalization of relations between Israel and Saudi Arabia and a Middle East where all of the modern Arab world is allied on one side and it's just Iran and its proxies on the other. If that's seen as a victory for Israel, for the United States, for the forces that are on the other side of Iran, then I think the door could be opened. If it's seen as a victory for Hamas and Iran, why would anyone even talk about it? So I would urge people to think about it in the strategic context, not in the emotional context, and not as something that is tomorrow, but it's over the horizon after all the proper conditions are addressed. In terms of the, whether it's achievable, I think the United States and Saudi Arabia are far advanced in the bilateral conversation. I think that for Israel to be able to reach an agreement with Saudi Arabia requires those two conditions and then we can drive the process, I think, rather quickly. In terms of Congress, so, I see a window for this to be done uh, during the presidency of President Biden. And uh, yes, but you know, you have two problems here for Israelis. One is that the current Israeli government is fully committed to block any attempt towards establishing a Palestinian state. We see, we see actions on the ground preventing it, presumably by, by settlers that uh, you even sanction some of them. But uh, the main focus of this government is to prevent it. And the other thing is that the wider public, even those, even many of those who would not vote for the current coalition, uh, feel, you know, they feel scared, they feel terrorized by what happened on October 7th. And they fail to see how this would be uh, prevented in the future by Palestinian states. How could they build this so I trust? Think on, on both of those issues, I, I understand that there's a lot of work to be done. I don't think we will know what the current government is willing to do until there's the moment of possible engagement on the final completion of a conversation. So first there has to be a ceasefire uh, and a hostage release that opens the pathway to these other diplomatic uh, uh, strategic objectives. In terms of the public, I think it would require across the political spectrum people having an honest conversation of the strategic advantages of normalized relations with Saudi Arabia in the context of defensible borders where there's no question about what happens in the day after where this is over the horizon, it's not tomorrow. Something that I think is 
very much the case is what October 7th proved is that without a Palestinian state, Israel was exposed to the worst attack uh, that it ever suffered uh, since independence. So it's not that a world without a, a Palestinian state avoided that risk. There are defensive questions, intelligence questions, questions of how do you make the country safe that exist regardless of what the political resolution is. The only pathway that leads to the kind of regional agreements that we're, we think are very much in Israel's interest and the United States' interest and the world's interest is to be willing to have this conversation. And if it were to work, it's the only way to turn the temperature down for the long term and reduce the growth of threats in the future. So we're very committed to the idea that it's the right solution. Only the government of Israel and the people of Israel can make the decision of whether to take that step. And I hope that in these coming weeks and months, there's a moment for the conversation that I just described. How dangerous it is for Israel's security, the, the fact that Israel has become a, a partisan issue in the United States. It's part of the political debate in a way that has never happened before. So let me divide that question a bit, Aluf, because I think there's strong bipartisan support for Israel. There's upwards of 70% of the Congress that supports uh, Israel. There's a challenge that there are fringes of both parties that are asking questions in a different way. There's a, on the right wing, a kind of isolationist tendency that has at the moment a bit of more tolerance for U.S. engagement with Israel, but its general worldview is inconsistent with that. And that's a danger going forward. On the, on the you know, left wing of the Democratic Party, there are serious questions being asked about Israel's conduct and the, 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 the issues that we were just talking about, the, the rights of Palestinians to dignity and, and self-governance. I think it's a mistake for um, any government of Israel to think that it would be a stronger relationship with the United States if there was a division on partisan lines. Um, right now, um, I don't see the, the reality in the United States reflecting that damage. If you roll the clock forward five years, 10 years, 20 years, this is a, a strategic issue with the United States being Israel's best friend and closest ally. You want there to be broad consensus. And if in fact you have hyper-partisanship in Washington, you don't want Israel to become a political football. So I think bipartisan support for Israel has always been important. It is only more important in a time of partisanship when part of each camp is asking more difficult questions. And, uh, and is your government uh, satisfied with the way Israel is conducting the war? I mean, there's, you know, it's, it's been uh, uh, severely criticized. Uh, there is, uh, the ICC is debating whether to issue arrest warrants for the prime minister and defense minister and, and leaders of Hamas, uh, making them equal. Uh, there's strong criticism all over the world for the Israeli conduct of war. Look, the president has been clear from October 7th on that Israel has a right and a responsibility to defend its people after an attack like October 7th. Um, there has been unwavering support for Israel's right to defend itself, um, and that has included not just an unprecedented supply of military support, uh, but the president's visit here at the very beginning of the war and uh, our ongoing support for Israel in the international forums from the UN to the ICC. I, I think the, the, the questions that the United States has asked from the beginning are very much appropriate because what the president said from the beginning of the war is Israel has a right and responsibility to defend itself, but it needs to do so in the framework of international uh, law and concern for human rights. And now we after almost a year, is, is it, you know, does Israel stand up to this standard? So I, I, I'm, I'm going to just continue for a moment to describe 
The impact of the U.S. engagement with Israel, um, uh, I think if you look at the issues related to humanitarian assistance, the U.S. engagement with Israel helped to achieve an understanding that it was in Israel's strategic and moral interest to provide humanitarian assistance, even if there are some who question that. I think on the way the war is conducted, uh, the U.S. has pressed very strongly that military operations had to, to the maximum extent possible, protect civilians and to use targeted approaches uh, using intelligence and precise munitions wherever possible. We've not told Israel that uh, Israel should not be attacking a Hamas as a governing or military power. What we've said is how it approaches that has to take account of these other issues that are very important. In some ways, it's an unfair fight because Hamas is not bound by the international law or the laws of humanity. Hamas fights putting its own citizens at harm, in harm's way every day. Israel is fighting with a deep concern for these issues, but the challenge of how do you fight an enemy that's embedded in a civilian population. We've been careful not to criticize things that are done in a manner that is consistent with the principles that I've described. We've raised questions when Israel needs to investigate things where there might have been actions that are not consistent with that. We've done what a good friend does. We've asked the hard questions and provided unwavering support. And, uh, and what would you say about Israeli conduct in the West Bank, both in counter-terrorism operations and in the attacks, pogroms by, by settlers on Palestinians and citizens? So we, we couldn't be more clear that we think that terrorist acts by extremist settlers demand a strong response, um, no less than terrorist acts by others. You know, we have put together a program to sanction individuals and organizations that we determine are engaged in that and to deny them access to the U.S. financial system. We've made uh, many, many um, uh, requests for information and pressed for consideration of these issues, and we continue to do so. We've long believed that uh, the, the, the aggressive uh, uh, you know, taking of land and, and, uh, uh, and building uh, in the West Bank um, is an impediment to uh, ultimately achieving a, a negotiated uh, uh, outcome to a two-state solution. So we've been very clear what we think um, is right and what we think is wrong. Um, you know, Israel is a sovereign nation. It has a complicated uh, system of government and coalition. And, you know, we press back uh, when we see things that uh, demand us to do so. Uh, we don't make decisions for the government of Israel. Um, what we can do is uh, offer our, 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 our strong uh, advice and sometimes raise strong concerns. Um, and I know I do that uh, on a regular basis, and I think we have to continue to do it. And last, but uh, I think pretty much not least for many people here in the audience, uh, are you worried to the future, what the future of Israeli democracy? And, has the, war, and, has, and has the war made you more worried about that? I think democracy is, is a, a precious treasure that in our country and yours, we have to put all of our energy into protecting and making sure uh, the next generation gets the benefit of. Um, I think we've been clear in the past of what we see as some of the challenges uh, to democratic institutions here. Um, the war has kind of uh, taken hold of most of the, of the time and, and intellectual energy, uh, uh, both in terms of uh, uh, government relations, but also the public. But uh, uh, democratic institutions are hard to build and easy to damage. Thank you so much, Ambassador Liu, and uh, for addressing the conference. And uh, good luck with your important mission to prevent war in the North. Well, good to be with you, Aloof, and I'm sorry my schedule changed and required to this to be by Zoom. I look forward to doing something in person. Thank you.